finish today. If we don't finish today, depending upon how much we have left, uh, we may still go ahead and have the exam on Thursday, but may start the class just finishing the play. I'm, I'm hoping that if we don't finish today, it'll only take 10 or 15 minutes to um, do what we need to do at the end, but we'll see. Okay, I want to pick up with Act 2, Scene 3. I'm, I said the other day that there would be quite a bit we can skip. Most of what we're going to be skipping are the bar scenes with Falstaff. Um, they're primarily there for some comic relief. And since we don't need comic relief and need to finish the play, uh, we're going to skip most of them. So I want to pick up with scene, uh, Act 2, Scene 3, page, uh, page 843, where we see Northumberland, his wife... Lady Northumberland, and Lady Percy, Hotspur's widow. And what we see in the beginning of this scene is Northumberland is getting ready to march off to war against Henry IV. And Lady Percy pretty severely upbraids him. She says, line 9 and following, well, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. Why? The time was, Father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now. When your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry, threw many a northward look to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. The time was, she says. Notice was. Past tense, right? Your, your time's gone. You should have gone before when Harry, her Harry, looked to you in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honors lost. There, back then. Okay? Two honors lost. Yours and your son's. How did Hotspur lose his honor? Died. Oh, the other one. He lost, yeah, Hotspur, not, not yeah. Northumberland, okay? For yours, the God of heaven brightened it. Notice she's suggesting God can, can overlook it, God can cleanse it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the gray vault of heaven, and by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. Great speech, by the way, if anybody is still looking for one to memorize. He had no legs that practiced not his gait, and speaking thick, which nature made his blemish. That is, he spoke with a thick northern accent. That's what she means there. Um, became the accents of the valiant. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse, to seem like him. So that in speech and gait and diet and affections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark and glass copy and book that fashioned others. We're going to hear the same kind of language applied to Hamlet. And I think Shakespeare probably has a model in mind for Hotspur, and that's Sir Philip Sidney, who died in 1588, right? not as a result of the Spanish Armada, but um, wars on the continent. And Sir Philip Sidney died at a relatively young age. I think he was, on top of my head, mid-20s. Okay? He had the gall to actually write a letter to, Prince, uh, to, me, to Queen Elizabeth telling her what to do. Okay? He was one of the men, he wasn't married, he was one of the men that was thought to be involved with Queen Elizabeth as a, as a possible... Suitor. He was injured in a battle in, in uh, the Netherlands and died uh, from gangrene about three weeks later. Okay? But he was held as the model knight. He could write. He wrote much poetry. Take a 16th century literature course and you'll read. You better, damn well better read. Uh, quite a bit of Sidney's poetry. He could dance. He could fight. He could sing, etc. 
right? So, in him, a wondrous him, the miracle of him, him did you leave. Notice the opposition. Second to none, unseconded by you. What does she mean, unseconded? Anybody know what the term, I'll be your second, means or refers to? What? It's like, it's not really second in command, but like, you're like, right by their side. Okay. Like, and not really a squire, like more than that, but like, I don't know. How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? In the Harry Potter novels, there's a couple of scenes where so-and-so says, I'll be your second. That's referring to a duel. Where, if the individual directly involved in the duel backs out, the second takes his place. All right? What she is saying is, you should have been right behind Hotspur. To look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem to send the fencible. So you left him. Each one of those syllables has stress. I mean, she's hammering. Never, oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him. In other words, don't tell me you're going off now for honor to fight alongside York and others against the king when you showed no honor for your own son. Let them alone. And then she gets it really, why? The marshal and the archbishop are strong, had my sweet Harry had but half their numbers. Today might I, hanging in a hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Who's Monmouth? Prince Hal, Prince Harry, okay? He says, you do draw my spirit from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. That is, you made me think about my son, Hotspur. She's kind of like, well, good. You shouldn't have forgotten him, okay? Lady Northumberland tells Northumberland, go to Scotland. And then Lady Percy says, if they get ground, advantage of the king, then join you with them. That is, if the, re if the rebels do gain the upper hand, then come down and join them. Why then? Because he'll no longer be in what? Danger. 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 Right? But for all, <clears throat> excuse me, but for all our loves, first let them try themselves. Let them prove themselves. So did your son. <laughs> so came I a widow. All right. So, Northumberland essentially agrees. We're going to skip to four and go all the way to very end of two four. I'm not going to talk about it, but notice Peto tells the prince, the king your father is at Westminster. And there are 20 weak and wearied posts come from the north. Postmen means essentially postal writers. There are, there's 20 writers from the north bringing news. By saying the king, your father, is at Westminster, he's holding a council of war. What's Peto telling Hal? Louder? And you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here in the tavern. Where should he be? Standing beside his father. Okay. Again, notice the juxtaposition. Northumberland, Percy, King Henry, Hal. Okay. So we get 3-1. The king calls in people. He gives letters out. And the page leaves. And King Henry gets a soliloquy. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Notice it's not a question, it's an exclamation. <coughs> sleep, oh gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse, 
How have I frighted thee that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? He's suffering from insomnia. Why? Well, he's going to tell us why. Why, rather sleep, liest thou in smoky cribs upon uneasy pallets stretching thee and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber? Then in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody. Why is it people are able to sleep in smoky rooms and on hard pallets, whereas I, who have a big, soft, comfy bed, covered with a canopy and musicians playing quietly in the background, can't get a wink. Oh, thou dull god. Why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds, and leaves the kingly couch a watch case or a common alarm bell? Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up thy shipboy's eyes? What's he talking about? The boy holding the night watch in the crow's nest of his ship. What's he supposed to be doing? Keeping an eye out for land. Okay, so that they don't run a shoal and rock his brains and cradle of the rude imperious surge and in the visitation of the winds. Notice, he's not saying that the boy up there in the crow's nest is, you know, like gently in a cradle rocking. This, get up on one of those masts, and when the ship moves, the mast really, if you've ever climbed a tall tree in a windstorm, if you had never have, you've missed one of the joys of childhood. Do it now. And in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamor in the slippery clouds, that with the hurly, death itself awakes. This kid can fall asleep here, and I can't. Canst thou, O partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude, and in the calmest and most stillest night with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy, low, lie down. Happy, low. You contented commoners. Sleep well. Why can't he sleep? Last line. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. So why can't he sleep? Is it because he's going to sleep with the crown on and the crown's pushing it? No. What's the crown symbolize there? Louder? What kind of pressure? Louder? Yes. He's thinking of all the problems the state is facing. Chief and foremost in his mind, open rebellion. I kind of imagine Abraham Lincoln probably did not sleep all that well from about 1860 to 1864. Okay. So, the earls come in, and the king says, ask them, have you read over the letters? They say, we have. The king asks. So, the king says, then you perceive the body of our kingdom. That is, you understand the state we're in. Pretty fitting to read this, you know, at this particular time. Because there's an awful lot of writers saying, today, we're about as close to civil war as we were 150 years ago. Only 150 years ago, we were in civil war, and it was, you know, fighting civil war. Now it's kind of a cold civil war. How foul it is, that is the country. What rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. Well, what's the heart of the kingdom? According to a king's perspective. The king. Okay. What's the danger? Where's Hal? Warwick says, It's but a body yet distempered, which to its former strength may be restored. Well, it's sick. Okay, just, you know, it needs some good antibiotics. King. Oh. God, that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times. Make mountains level 
and the continent, weary of solid firmness, melt itself into the sea, and other times to see the beachy girdle of the ocean too wide for Neptune's hips, how chances mocks and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors. Heraclitus famously said, All is in flux. What's the king saying here? What has time done in the past? Raised up mountains, leveled mountains. Has raised the level of the ocean to overtake land. He's talking about floods. He's not talking about global warming. You know. So, oh, if this were seen, the happiest youth, viewing his progress through, what perils passed, that is, what obstacles he had overcome, what crosses to come, things to bear, would do what? Would shut the book and sit him down and die. If we knew, knew, not guessed, not thought, but knew what tomorrow brought, or next week brought, or next year brought, we'd call it quits. He's saying, if we knew what fate, quote unquote, had in store for us, if Oedipus knew, really knew, and really believed what fate had in store for him, he wouldn't have tried to flee his parents. He would have killed himself right then and there. Okay? So, Tis not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together. And in two years after were they at wars. It's been eight years since the death of Richard. It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest my soul. Remember, who welcomed Bolingbroke back from his banishment? It was Northumberland. who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot, yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. But which of you was by, and he looks at Warwick, you, Cousin Neville, you were, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and raided by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy. Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Shakespeare, you know, plagiarizing himself there. Though then, God knows, which by the way is utterly asinine to say that you can plagiarize yourself. You, you can't plagiarize yourself. Plagiarism is taking somebody else's. Though the English department says that you, that you can't play. Sorry. <laughs> Forget what the English department says. Did speak these words, Northumberland, thou ladder by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne, though then God knows I had no such intent. Notice, God knows. He's not saying this to his enemies. He's saying it to his closest advisors. So are we to take that as Henry being sincere, or is this Henry Truth trying to cover his tracks? Is this Henry being a quote-unquote unreliable narrator? Depends upon your interpretation of what kind of character King Henry IV has. Or Henry Bolingbroke slash King Henry IV. I think he's being honest. I think he's saying, when I came back, I did not have any intention of deposing the king. I think the idea of deposing the king grew as he moved into England and saw people calling for him, clamoring for him. I mean, who wouldn't be buoyed up by that kind of praise? I had no such intent, but that necessity so bowed the state, I love this line, that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. Which play is it? Um, not Twelfth Night. Where Shakespeare has the, has the speech, you know, some people are born great, some people are made great, and some people have greatness thrust upon them. I'm going to wrap.
rack my brain trying to figure out which one that is. It's toward the end of the phase. So, the time shall come, thus did he follow it, the time will come that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption, so went on. In the division of our amity, Warwick, there is a history in all men's lives, figuring the nature of the times deceased, right? Look at what the gloss says, depicting, reproducing. What's he suggesting? Picturing, reproducing what? The nature of the times deceased, times past. George Santayana, 20th century philosopher, famously said what about history? Close. If you don't learn the lessons of history, you're doomed to repeat them. The witch observed. What are the witch observed? Times deceased, times past. A man may prophesy. If you learn from the past, if you learn those messages, you can prophesy. Is it really prophecy? No. It's simply saying, don't do this again. With a near aim or the main chance of things has not yet come to life. Who in their seeds and weak beginnings lie in treasury. Such things become the hatch and brood of time, and by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland. In other words, he wasn't prophesying. Richard was merely aware of the past. Well, what had happened in the past? Had there been uprisings before? Yes. Had there been deposings of kings? No, they hadn't gone that far. Right? So the king, are these things then necessities? What does he mean by necessities? What is something that is a necessity? A necessity. What does that word literally mean? You need it to survive. Okay. Or it's something that will be. If you're not talking about like a food necessity or a clothing necessity, it's something that is required. If you're talking about the times, okay then it is something that will happen. The king is asking, are these things then fated? Is there a way to turn them from happening? Is there a way to stop it? Then let us meet them like necessities. And that same word even now cries out on us. They say the bishop in Northumberland are 50,000 strong. What does he mean? Let us meet them like necessities. Death is a necessity, right? You can't outrun it. You can't shy away from it. It will happen. How, so how do you meet death? Do you choose to off yourself, quote unquote, before your time? Or to pull it behind the Beowulf story, I think, is implying at least one thing throughout the story, throughout the poem Beowulf, which is that you got to prepare to die. You have to be prepared for when death comes. Problem is, we don't know when death comes, do we? I mean, this is Hamlet's, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh and to be or not to be speech, right? They're both about being ready for death. So let's meet them like necessities. So how do you meet one's necessary death? You just roll over and let it happen? Or do you fight on? No matter the odds, Warwick can't be. Can't be. There's no way they've got 50,000. And he introduces the idea, rumor doth double. Nah, maybe 25. Right. Skip 3-2. That's Falstaff and Mistress Shallow and such. 
and Bardolph and others and go to 4-1. By the way, I ought to throw this out there. It's not a question on the exam or anything, which the exam is already written. Apparently, Queen Elizabeth was so enamored of the character of Falstaff. Okay? Anecdotal evidence says, and the anecdotal evidence is that she asked Shakespeare, write another play focusing on Falstaff. Notice Falstaff is more in this play than he is in Henry IV, Part One. And so, according to the anecdotal evidence, Shakespeare then writes The Merry Wives of Windsor, which is has Falstaff as its central character, trying to get in and out of the beds of various merry wives of Windsor and failing each time. Okay? Whether that's true or not, you know, we don't have conclusive evidence, but all right, 4-1. We see the Archbishop of York, Mowbray. Who is Mowbray? Thomas Mowbray's son. We're gonna hear him speak about, you know, problems dad had with the current king, in a little bit, okay. Bardolph, Hastings, others, and Westmoreland comes in. Okay, now, the Archbishop of York, Mowbray, Bardolph, Hastings, etc., those are all among the rebel faction. Westmoreland comes in, he's united with the king. And Westmoreland, he's there for a parley, okay. He says, health and fair greeting from our general line, 28 or so, the Prince Lord John and Duke of Lancaster. Okay. So Westmoreland, the uh, Archbishop says, okay, speak on, what are you here for? And Westmoreland essentially says, we want to know what your grief is. We will listen to your questions and such. And you notice he uses language towards the second half of his speech about the archbishop and the archbishop's spiritual power as opposed to the king's temporal power or secular power. And how the reason the archbishop has his spiritual power is because he's protected by the temporal powers of the state. This is the whole church-state controversy. Okay. So he says, 41, I wasn't going to talk about this, but you, Lord Archbishop, for example, who see, that is his archbishopric, his diocesan see, is maintained by a civil peace, that is a civil power, whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched, that is the reason you are alive, is because there has been peace in the land, whose learning of good letters Peace hath tutored, whose white investments figure innocence. The dove and very blessed spirit of peace. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay? You are endowed and vested with the powers, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit. Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war? What's Westmoreland getting at? You're supposedly a man of what? God. You shouldn't be leading rebel factions into war. What's your, what's your beef? Wherefore do I this? The archbishop asks. To this end, we are all diseased, and with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it. He doesn't mean we've got to die for it. He means we must be bled. The old medicinal medical idea that if somebody is ill, stick them with a knife and let some blood out because I've got too much blood. Kind of crazy. Of which disease our late King Richard being infected died. Notice though, because Richard died, the disease didn't go away. No, the disease now is elsewhere, being infected die, but my most noble lord of Westmoreland, I take not on me here as a physician. So, hear me more plainly. I have an equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs, what evils, okay? and what wrongs or evils we suffer, and find our griefs heavier than our offenses. 
In other words, I have to do a wrong and evil to overcome a greater wrong or evil. So it's the lesser of two evils. By the rough torrent of occasion, and have the summary of all our griefs when time shall serve to show in articles. That is, we will draw up articles to, to the king, which long ere this we offered to the king, and might by no seen get our... We offered these articles of our griefs to the king, he says, and he wouldn't listen. Might by no suit gain our audience. When we are wronged and would enfold our griefs, we are denied access unto his person, even by those men that have most done us wrong. Who are those men that have most done us wrong? The knights and nobles who surround the king. Right? And by saying we would address our wrongs to the king, Upon what basis legally would the Archbishop and others be acting? Magna Carta. Signed in 1215, this is 200 years later, nearly 200 years later. Magna Carta gave the knights and nobles that right to seek redress of wrongs. One of the Bill of Rights. First Amendment, right? So, the dangers of the days but newly gone, whose memory is written on the earth, da, 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 da. Westmoreland. When was your appeal denied? Where in have you been galled by the king? What peer hath been suborned to grade on you? Boom, boom, boom. Facts. Give me facts. Give me dates, he's saying. Okay. So they keep going back and forth. And then we hear Mowbray, line 113, jump in. We're not going to talk about the speech, but it's in 113 that Mowbray informs us, I am the son to Thomas Mowbray, and he and the king, he, my father, and the king, you know, had issues. And listen to Westmoreland, 130. You speak, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. You don't know what you're talking about, son. In other words, you don't know what your father and the king had against each other. Well, what else doesn't he know, apparently? What did the king say he was going to do at the end of Henry IV, Part I? He was going to repeal Mowbray's banishment, only to find out he was already dead. And forgive him. It wasn't he going to repeal the banishment and then, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one against him. All right. So, Westmoreland finishes his speech, page 856, line 141. Here come I from our princely general. Who's his princely general? John, Duke of Lancaster. Why is it John, Duke of Lancaster? At the end of... Henry IV, Part One. what did the king say? John, Duke of Lancaster, would go with Northumberland, excuse me, would go with Westmoreland north to meet the opposing forces. Okay? John as the leader, with Westmoreland kind of standing behind, flexing his muscles. I come from our princely general to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace, he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, that is, where your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. You will get what you seek. Everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. Okay? Mowbray. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not love. That is strategy, not love. Mowbray, you overween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy, not from fear. This offer from Prince John, he says, is merciful. It's not because we are afraid of losing. Our battle is more full of names of, than yours. Our men more perfect in the use of arms. Our armor all is strong. And notice, Shakespeare, the good rhetorician that he is, understands you saved the most important point for the last. Our cause the best. Our cause is just. What is it? 
defending the kingdom. What is their cause? Open rebellion. By open rebellion, they automatically side, so to speak, with Satan. All right? I'm not saying they're satanic or anything like that. Don't go there. So, Hastings 162 says, Hath the Prince John a full commission? In very ample virtue of his father to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions? That is, has his father given him full authority to make offers and fulfill them? Yes. All right. So, for two, let's see here. Prince John of Lancaster and his army come in, and we see Mowbray and the Archbishop and Hastings, etc. Notice how he speaks to them. He doesn't call them dirty, rotten, rebel scum. He addresses them with honor. He addresses them with respect. All right. And they talk. We're going to skip quite a bit. And pick up on 858 at the top. They kind of give Prince John their articles of grievances, and Westmoreland says, line 52, pleases your grace to answer them directly how far forth you do like their articles. That is, you agree to their terms, so to speak. I like them all. I hear your grievances. We will resolve them. And do allow them well, and swear here... Okay, notice this. This is really important. Swear here, by the honor of my blood. What does he mean, the honor of his blood? He's royalty. That's it. Notice, honor here by the prince is what? Something you're born with because of your genealogy. If you're not royal, therefore, you don't have honor. This is the, one of the whole themes behind, the more I think about it, and the more I watch this film, the better and better it gets. Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger, which is a kind of a, you know, it's based on Chaucer's The Knight's Tale, but it really gets a lot of the medieval ideas really, really well. My father's purposes have been mistook, misunderstood, and some about him have too lavishly rested his meaning and authority. That is, some who are close to my father have played a little too loose with his authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, that is, if this, this what? My word, my princely honor. If this may please you, what did he ask them to do? Next line. Discharge your powers, disperse your armies unto their several counties, as we will ours. And here, between the armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace that all their eyes, the various armies, may see us. And go home and what? Report what they've seen. Our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. In other words, your word is your bond. Your word is good for me. So I give it you and will maintain my word. They drink together. They embrace. Okay. Skip a little bit to the next column. Westmoreland leaves after Prince John tells him, go discharge our troops. Hastings goes to discharge their troops. 97. Prince John says, I trust, lords, we shall lie tonight together. Westmoreland comes back in. And he asks, Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? Still. It, it hasn't moved yet. Okay. The leaders having charge from you to stand will not go off until they hear you speak. The leaders of the armies, Westmoreland is saying, are suggesting they only leave when you tell them to. Why? He's the commander. 
Prince John. They know their duties. Now, death, obviously a very short line, but it is a very pregnant line because of what we're going to see come up later. Hastings comes in, and he speaks to the archbishop. My lord, our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unloked, they unyoked, they what? Boom! I mean, as soon as Hastings and the other leaders of the rebel forces said, you can go home, whew, kind of implies they weren't necessarily 100% in this. East, west, north, south are like a school broke up. Each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Westmoreland, good tidings, my lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason. Who else gets arrested? The archbishop. And you, lord archbishop, and you, lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Capital treason means what? They're going to die. Capital crime. Is this proceeding just and honorable? What did the prince swear to? By my honor, I will accept your grievances. Archbishop, will you break your faith? Your word? I pawned thee none. Pawned. What's your gloss say? 112. Pledged. Sold, if you want. Thee none. I promised you redress of these same grievances which you did complain, which, by mine honor, I will perform with a most Christian care. In other words, the things you actually brought to my attention, yeah, those I will redress. But for you, rebels, look to taste the due meet for rebellion and such act as yours. In other words, you didn't also ask me for what? Louder. Clemency. Leniency. Okay. Pardon. Exactly. In, in other words, you enter into a negotiation with somebody who has a sword over your head, you better be very sure that you get all of the clauses you need in that negotiation to protect yourself, right? Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray, that is, and go after these armies. God and not we hath safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death. Okay, skip 4-3, pick up with 4-4. Four, four. King comes in with Warwick, Thomas, Duke of Clarence, that's one of his sons, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, it's another one of his sons, okay? Both younger than John of Lancaster, all younger than Hal, Prince of Wales. So, the king asks, line 12 or so, of Humphrey, where is the prince, your brother? Windsor? How company? I don't know. Is Thomas with him? Thomas. No, I'm here, Dad. <laughs> okay. How chance thou art not with the prince, thy brother? He, keep in mind, they're all princes, so kind of... He loves thee, and thou dost neglect him, Thomas. Thou hast a better place in his affection than all thy brothers. Cherish it, my boy. Noble effect, the offices thou mayest effect a mediation after I am dead, between his greatness and thy other brethren. What's the king mean? He says, because the prince loves you more than his other brothers, you can serve kind of as a mediator between the prince and his other brothers. Why would the prince need a mediator? So that John doesn't decide, hmm, I'd kind of like to be king. Therefore omit him not, blunt not his love, nor lose a good advantage of his grace, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Clarence, I shall observe him with all care and love. Why aren't you at Windsor with him? Uh, he's not there today. See, but Gloucester said he was. 
Was Gloucester trying to cover for the prince? It's unclear. He's in London. And how accompanied, that is, who's he with? Uh, Pons and his other continual followers. Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds. And he, the noble image of my youth. In other words, spit an image of me when I was his age. Is overspread with them. Them what? Weeds. Therefore my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart. When I do shape and forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. What's he saying is going to happen upon his death? Well, how will become king? And there will be what? Unguided days and rotten times. Apparently, Hal's overcoming Hotspur wasn't enough to dispel Henry IV's doubts. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, that is, nothing to enclose it, nothing to stop him, when means and lavish manners meet together, means, what does he mean by means? Yeah. Yeah. Lavish manners, he likes to eat well. He likes to spin well. And guess what? He's got the royal treasury. Oh, with what wing shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay? Why? Who else acted like that? Richard II. Warwick. No, no, no. That's, that's not what the prince is like. And Warwick tells us the prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue wherein to gain the language tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learned which once attained your highness knows, highness knows comes to no further use but to be known and hated. So like gross terms the prince will in the perfectness of time Cast off his followers, and their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live by which his grace must meet the lives of others, turning past evils to advantages. By which his grace must meet, what's meet there mean? Judge. The prince is studying this class of society. Why? To better understand them, to become a better prince. What did we see from Hal in our first introduction to him in the first play, in Act One, in um, Henry the Fourth, Part One? I know you all. What does he say? I'm going to be like the sun, hidden behind base contagious clouds, that when I break forth behind these base contagious clouds, he will what? He will glitter over all my past faults. He will show so shine that everyone will forget that. Warwick is saying it's all part of his act. So if you take Hal's words in that soliloquy, and you take Warwick's words here as being true, what's that tell us about Hal? Is it devious? It is very... Machiavellian. It's extremely Machiavellian. But to, whether you consider it devious or prudent depends upon your understanding of kind of Machiavelli. Okay? So, skip the rest of that. Act 4, 5. Act 4, scene 5. Hal comes in. Notice, the prince is born to another part of the stage, stage direction. He's on a bier. Why? He's almost dead. And he's laid on a bed, and Hal's there, and Hal says, 21, Why doth the crown lie here there upon his pillow, being so troublesome? bedfellow. 
Oh, Paulish perturbation. He's talking about the crown itself. Paulish perturbation, golden care, that keeps the that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely big and bound snores out the watch of night. Oh, majesty. When thou dost pinch thy bearer, that is, when the crown pinches the head of the bearer. How? Because the bearer's head kind of swells up and the crown shrinks it down, so to speak. Thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scalds with safety. By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire? All right. What's he talking about? Louder? Who isn't breathing? Hal thinks what's happened to his father. Is he breathing? My gracious Lord, my father! The sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many kings. The sleep of death. Notice, it's divorced many English kings. It's divorced them from their kingship. Thy do from me is tears. What does he mean, thy due? What I owe you. What does he owe his father? Filial duty. I mean, we're gonna. this is going to come up really big in King Lear. So, thy due from me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood. My father is dead. Which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously which, as immediate from thy place and blood, derives itself to me. What does he mean, derives itself to me? Uh, sorry, I skipped that line. My due from thee is this imperial crown. What you owe to me, owe now why? Because he thinks he's dead. I owe you tears, heavy sorrows, you owe me the crown. And he takes the crown and plops it on his head. Because it derives itself to me. Lo, where it sits, which God shall guard. And put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. This from thee will I to mine leave, as tis left to me. This from thee, the crown, I to mine will leave his what? His eldest son. He doesn't have one yet. He gets married at the end of King Henry V, or the play Henry V, when he meets Catherine. Okay. Again, watch Kenneth Branagh's, because that was when Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson were still married. He was only like 23 when he made that film, and it won an Oscar. And that was when they were both young and gorgeous. And she's sitting there rattling off in French. And he's kind of stumbling through it. Because one of the entire scenes of Act 5 is entirely in French. Okay? So, puts the crown on and leaves. And the king wakes up. Warwick Gloucester Clarence, why'd you leave me here? Alone. No, the prince was with you. Prince of Wales? Where? He's not here. He took the crown. The prince hath taken it hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death? Find him. Notice what the king is kind of suggesting there. He just couldn't wait. You know, it's like the line in Monty Python. I'm not dead yet. This part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. He is pushing me even faster. See, sons, what things you are. How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. How does nature fall into revolt? What does he mean there? What should nature do? 
Yeah, but he's not talking about nature as a goddess or nature as natural stuff. Nature there is, what should a son's natural act, reaction or action be in response to a father who is dying or dies? Yeah, it's morning. It's what Hal talked about earlier in that scene. But it falls into revolt when what? Well, daddy's leaving me $20 million, so maybe I'll <clears throat> off him now. For this the foolish, care, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts of their brains with care. They have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange achieved gold. For this they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises. When, like the bee tolling from every flower, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive, like the bees are murdered for our pains. We save up all the stuff and then our rotten kids come and take it from us. It's kind of what he's getting at. King come, uh, Harry comes in. I thought never to see you speak again. He's carrying the crown now. He's not wearing it. Sorry. King tells everybody, out. Why? Because this is going to be one of those tongue lashings like we saw in, what was it, 4-1 or 3-1 in Henry IV Part 1. I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was father, Harry, to that thought. You didn't want to hear me speak again. You just couldn't wait to get that crown on your head. I stay too long by thee. I weary thee. Didst thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with my honors before thy hour be ripe? Oh, foolish youth. Thou seeks the greatness that will overwhelm thee. In other words, be careful what you wish for. Stay but a little. My day is dim, etc., etc. Um, yeah, probably got time. He goes on and says, line one hundred three: Thy life did manifest; thou lovedst me not. Didst manifest. What's Shakespeare mean? Your life made clear to me. You don't love me. How? How did it show that? Your actions. You're never here. You're always at the taverns. And thou wilt have me die assured of it. You will have me die knowing you don't love me. Thou hidst a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, which thou hast wedded on thy stony heart to stab at half an hour of my life. Why canst thou not forbear me half an hour? In other, I, I'm almost gone. Give me at least 30 more minutes, kid. And get, then get thee gone and dig my grave thyself and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should be due my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. He's implying, oh, you're going to need a lot of sanctifying. Only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time has come to mock at form. Pluck down my officers. What does almost every president do upon not being elected, but upon taking the oath of office, usually within the first 90 days. Pretty much the old political appointees are gone. Who do those political appointees include? As an example. Yeah, I mean, cabinet officials. But who closer down to us? Federal prosecutors. Federal prosecutors. There's like 90 of them. I think, that's, I think that's around the number. Almost every president requests their resignation. Why? Because the president wants to put in his own people. Okay? When Henry VIII became king, one of the first things he did 
was he killed one of his father's closest advisors, who was an advisor to Henry VIII, because Henry VIII was only 18 years old when he became king, and he knew, I've got to put my stamp of authority. So he started killing the old guys, right? So, he says, pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time has come to mock it for him. Harry V is crowned. Up, vanity, down, royal stage. All you sage counselors, hints. Sage, wise, old, prudent. Well, who's one of the sage counselors he's referring to? We've already seen him. We haven't talked about him. But he's shown up a couple of times with Falstaff, the chief justice. You know, he's going to bust him for the Cad's Hill robbery. He said, but because of that little thing he did at Shrewsbury, we're going to let that slide. He showed up again in the tavern in this play. Okay? And to the English court assemble now from every region apes of idleness. Falstaffs, Bardolphs, Pedos, Quanzas, etc. He goes on and says, Be happy, he will trouble you no more. England shall double guild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honor, might. For the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. It is, no, it is going to be nothing but riot and mayhem when Harry is crowned king. Prince <clears throat> kneels. Hands the crown over. Pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the most moist impediments under my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke, ere you with grief had spoken, I had heard the course of it so far. But for my tears, he says, I had forestalled this. Dear and deep rebuke. Ere you with grief had spoken, I had heard the course of it so far. What's he mean? I, I didn't realize how deeply you believed this about me. Okay? There's your crown. And he that wears the crown immortally, God, what? Long guard it yours. If I affect it more than as your honor and, your, and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise, which my most inward true and duteous spirit teacheth this prostrate and exterior bending. That is, my soul will teach my body to stay here. Why? Because my soul is true to you. God witness with me. As God is my witness, when I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do feign, oh, let me in my present wildness die and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed. Purposed. Intended. He's telling his father right there, everything you've seen of me in the taverns or heard of me in the taverns is all what? It's all part of an act. And if I'm lying, like, may God kill me now, so that I will die what? In infamy. So that I will die with a stain on my name. Coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and dead almost, my leave, to think you were, that is, and I nearly died thinking you were dead, I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus I braided it. The care on thee depending hath fed upon the body of my father. In other words, the crown did what to his father? It killed him. It shortened his life. Therefore, thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other less fine in carrot is more precious, preserving life and medicine potable. But thou most fine, most honored, most renowned, has eat thy bearer up. Thus my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head. 
If he accused it thus and put it on his head, what's he essentially doing? Well, the crown's going to do the same thing to him as it did to his father. To try with it. That is to fight with it. As with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy, or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it, let God forever keep it from my head. O oh, my son, God had put it in thy mind to take it hence that thou mightst win the more thy father's love. God told you, put it in your mind to do this. Why? So that we can have this little tete-a-tete. -tete. You know that phrase, tete-a-tete? -tete? What does it literally mean? Head-to-head. -head. So we can have this heart-to-heart -heart conversation so that I would really know you love me. Come hither, Harry. Sit thou by my bed. Right? And he goes and he sits by the bed. And when he goes and sits by the bed, he is what? He's on an equal footing. The king is lying down. Here he's sitting. I don't think the king is lying down like on a bed that's up on a platform four feet high. See, in Elizabethan England, your head is never supposed to be above the monarchs. Never. Which is why when Henry VIII was alive, Tudor, England, when Henry VIII was alive, people had to fully bow down. You lift your head up to look. All right? And here I think the very latest counsel that I shall ever breathe. And he gives Harry his counsel. Um, okay, we won't do the rest of that. 5-1 we're going to skip. 5-2. We see Warwick and the Chief Justice and others come in. And Warwick asks the Chief Justice. How doth the king, exceeding well, his cares are now all ended. And I'm not sure, but that might be, ooh, I'd have to check on that. That might be Shakespeare showing us he is familiar with Oedipus the king. Anybody know how Oedipus the king ends? The chorus. And the chorus says, count no man blessed till he is dead. Free of all cares. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature. And to our purposes, he lives no more. To our purposes, to our intentions here in this life, the king's no longer our issue. Okay? So the Chief Justice, phew, in response to Warwick's, indeed, I think the young king loves you not. <laughs> I know he doth not. And do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time. Yeah, I know he doesn't love me. Why? Because he's the one who's been having to keep going to the taverns to roust him out of there. Okay? So, we see Prince John of Lancaster, Thomas of Clarence, Humphrey of Gloucester with others. And they come in and Warwick says, here come the heavy issue of dead Harry. The heavy issue, the children. Heavy mourning. Oh, that the living Harry had the temper of he, the worst of these three gentlemen. So Prince John, others come in. The Chief Justice, line 35, speaks in response to Clarence, who says, Well, you must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair, which swims against your stream of quality. You've got to start being nicer to Falstaff. Sweet princes, what I did, I did in honor. Notice, did. What I, in the past, when I upbraided Falstaff, I did it in honor. Led by the impartial conduct of my soul, and never shall you see that I will beg a ragged in person. Uh-uh. Nope. Not going to. I'm not going to change my conduct to Falstaff. And they're like, boy, are you in for it. The king comes in. Which king? Henry V. And he says, This new and gorgeous garment 
majesty sits not so easy on me as you think. As you think, Hal, Hal, my word, is telling us that the <coughs> now brothers to the king think, oh, he thinks he's all high and mighty now. He's got the throne. He's going, mm -mm. nope. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. Fear of him. This is the English, not the Turkish court. What in the world is he talking about? Why not the Turkish court? Where a new, at this time, sultan would do what when he became sultan to his younger brothers? Kill them all. Why? That's how you make sure nobody tries to take your spot. Not Amarath and Amarath succeeds, but Harry, Harry. Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith it very well becomes you. Sorrow so royally in you appears, and I will deeply put the fashion on it, wear it in my heart. Why then be sad, but entertain no more of it. Good brothers, then a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured, I'll be your father and your brother too. Father how? Protector. King. You want to go all patriarchy? This is the patriarchy speaking. Okay. Let me but bear your love. I'll bear your cares. Well, how does he bear their cares? He's got the crown. They don't have to bear it. Yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives, shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. So, Chief Justice is addressed and says, uh, Hal says, um, you are, I think, assured I love you not? <laughs> yeah, I am assured, if I may be measured rightly, that your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. Notice, he doesn't say your majesty hath no cause to hate me. You have no just cause. So if you do hate me, you don't hate me rightfully. King, how might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? Great rebuke and roughly send to prison the immediate heir of England? Was this easy? That is, was it easy for you to do this? I then did use the person of your father. That is, I acted how? Under the authority of your father. The image of his power lay then in me and in the administration of his law while I was busy for the commonwealth. <laughs> your highness please it to forget my place. You didn't treat me with the respect and deference I deserved as chief justice. You forgot my place, the majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I presented, and struck me in my very seat of judgment, whereon, as an offender to your father, I gave bold way to my authority. I gave bold way. That might be the chief justice's way of saying, okay, I might have been a little zealous in my pursuit of you. Okay. If the deed were ill, be you contented, that is, be happy, Wearing now the garland, to have a son set your decrees and not. Imagine now, as king, that you had a son who acted like you did. What would you do? Okay. How? You are right, Justice. And you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword. What's the balance? The scales of justice. And I do wish your honors may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that I have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son. Okay. He goes on and says, you did commit me. That means you sent me to jail. I was the prince. You did commit me, for which I do commit unto your hand 
the unstained sword that you have used to bear. In other words, and you guess what? You get to keep your job, and you have my authority 100%. With this remembrance, that is, keep in mind that you use the same with the like bold, just, and impartial spirit as you have done against me. This is Hal's way of saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> there is my hand. He shakes hands. See, nobody else really touched the king. He shakes his hand. And then he goes one step further. You shall be as a father to my youth. Why to my youth? Because he's young. He's only like 18 or so. I don't remember his exact age, but I think he's around 18 or so. He's really young. His father's dead. He's saying, I need a father figure. You. You shall be as a father to my youth. My voice shall, shall sound as you do prompt mine ear. The Chief Justice will speak into King Henry V's ear, or Henry V's ear, and what will King Henry V say? What the King Justice just told him, or what the Chief Justice just told him. And I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise directions. Okay? He's going to let or allow the chief justice to guide him. To, to use the language King Henry IV used before he died, act as a curb on his riots. So when Hal starts to, the chief justice will gently move him back. And princes all, that is, John, Clarence, Thomas, believe me, I beseech you. My father has gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb by my affections, and with his spirit, sadly, I survive, to mock the expectation of the world. Why? What's the expectation of the world? Yeah, he's going to be a horrible king. So he's going to mock that expectation. To frustrate prophecies and to raise out rotten opinion, who hath written me down after my seeming, seeming appearance. Well, who does that include? Who thinks, who thought Hal was essentially a wastrel? Everyone. Everyone. He was that good of an actor. All right. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and add back to the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now we call Parliament. And let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation. Okay? So he finishes that speech and go to 5-5. Five five, very end of the play. And we're going to have time and I'm going to make just a couple comments about Henry V. They don't show up on the exam, but just to Throw it out there. 5-5. Five, five. The king's been crowned. He's now in full royal regalia. Okay. And he's walking by. His train and everybody pass over the stage. And after them come 5-5. Five, five. Falstaff, Mr. Shallow. Um, uh, sorry, the sheriff, Shallow, Pistol Bardolph, and the boy. And we hear... Falstaff line 40, 40, I guess. God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal. Hal implies what? Informality, familiarity. Now, you don't go up to Prince Charles and go, Prince Chuck, how you doing? No. You don't call him Prince or King Hal. Why? Because he's King Henry V. Pistol. The heavens, the guard and keep most royal 
what of fame? Imp. What's an imp? A mischievous, devilish spirit. God save thee, my sweet boy. The king. My lord, chief justice, speak to that vain man. Remember the scene where Falstaff pretended to be Henry IV? And Hal was himself? And then Hal pretended to be Henry IV? And Falstaff pretended to be Hal? And the Chief Justice, have you your wits? Know you what tis you speak? My King, my Jove, I speak to thee, my heart, my heart. What's Falstaff saying there? Without you, without my heart, I'm nothing. I'm dead. I know thee not, old Cue your country music song, you know, just cut my heart out and fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs becomes a fool and jester. What does he mean? How ill white hairs becomes a fool and jester. What should come with white hairs? Wisdom, gravity, solemnity. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man. Why long dreamt? Hal is telling us. Until now, it's all a dream. My life till now was like a dream, which Puck told us what? Vanishes. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane, but being awaked, why? Because he's king now. He's no longer what he was. Everything he was before was as a dream, yielding nothing. Now the people see the real how, not the shadow that they saw before. But being awake, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hints. And that has two meanings. Make your body less present here, take it away, but also lose some weight, Falstaff. You're grossly overweight. And more thy grace. How do I know that he's telling to lose some weight? Leave gormandizing. Gormandizing. It's a fancy French word for gluttony. Don't be a glutton. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. This is how fat Falstaff is. You know, the grave is normally about three feet by six feet. No, he's using hyperbole. Falstaff isn't going to be nine feet by six feet, but he is telling us, you got to get an extra large casket for him. Reply not to me. Because it's like false. He sees Falstaff about to say something. Reply not to me with a full born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. Biblical idea here. The old Adam is gone, and the new Adam has come. So will I those that kept me company. What did Falstaff think would happen once Hal became king? He'd have it made. He would be in with the king. When thou dost hear I am as I have been, approach me. When you hear that Hal is back, then you can come into the court. What's he saying? Uh, never, because <laughs> that's not going to happen. And thou shalt be as thou wast the tutor and the feeder of my rights. Till then, I banish thee. Banish Bardolph, banish Peto, banish Pons. Falstaff says in that scene where he pretends to be Hal, and Hal pretends to be Henry V. But banish not Jack, banish not Falstaff. And Hal says what? I will... I shall. 
Till then I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten miles. So if I'm at Windsor, there's a ten mile protection zone. If I'm in London, you got to stay outside London. For competence of life, I will allow you, that is, but I'm going to give you a pension. You're going to have enough to live on. You're not going to rob people anymore. You're not going to cheat people out, like Mr. Squickly, the owner of the tavern. That lack of means enforce you not to evils. Do you remember I, I mentioned, I think, before, during Henry VIII's day, Parliament passed laws against being poor made it illegal to be poor. So how do, you, how, how do you not break the law? Hal's telling us, I'm going to make it so that you don't have to break the law in order to live. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, not just Falstaff, but the others, we will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement. As you clean up your act, we will raise you higher and higher, and the implication is maybe allow you to come closer and closer. Okay? So, 92. The Chief Justice says, carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. What's the fleet? I've walked by it probably a hundred times. It's a prison. I'm taking Falstaff to prison. Okay? And the others. False stuff, my lord, my, and not now. Prince John, I like this fair proceeding of the kings. In other words, wow. He hath intent his wanted followers shall be very well provided for. But all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. In other words, until they fit better. Okay? And then you've got an epilogue, which I'm not going to talk about. Very briefly. And I'm going to send you, I'm going to um, send by email an example of the exam. It'll be an exam from a different class. The exam has 50 fill-in-the-blank question. No, it's 25 fill-in-the-blanks and then something like 25 um, passages to idea. They're each, they're each worth two points, okay? And then I think 30 points extra credit. Um, the thing real quickly about Henry V, the play opens with Hal receiving a box from the Dauphin of France, the son of the king. And the Dauphin of France essentially sends this box to Hal because he's challenging him. What he knows of Hal is of the Hal who hung around with Falstaff. And what we see in that opening scene in the play is Hal showing us, no, I'm the king now, and you don't mess with the king. He says, I will take these balls, because they're tennis balls, and I will return such a serve as French shall have caused to me. In other words, I'm going to lose unholy hell on France, and he does. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. I also sent an email out today um, about paper topics. If you're having difficulty coming up with a uh, paper idea, hopefully it will help you come up with an idea. All right, test on Thursday. If I have